Okay, uh, here we are at part four. <laughs> this is so unbelievably long, this uh, work tonight. I, uh, I might just have to shut up till August because this is not spent. Anyway, all right. I have a lot to say, I guess, about this. So, um, so yeah, so here are a couple of other um, hunks of mud that get flung at ENFPs pretty regularly. And again, understandably, I can see how this happens. Um, we get accused of being crazy. And we also get accused of being fickle. I, in the last video, I was talking about how um, it might come to be in many cases that ENFPs uh, disappoint people and then those people feel uh, through an erroneous deduction process they feel in which they leave out and any sort of understanding of what dominant NE is like um, and what it must do um, then or, or just a dislike of it too to be fair you know maybe it's just a dislike and that's that anyway um, how it all of that to say uh, how it is that um, people may mistakenly assume that uh, ENFPs, you know, they start out as like they woo you and they charm you and they're so sweet and adorable and lovey and whatever. And then they turn, you know, they turn and they're cold, heartless, awful people who, um, you know, let you down and, and uh, don't live up to their end of the bargain and, uh, of whatever the relationship expectations were of the other one or where they thought things were going to go or anyway, I don't know. That's whatever. All kinds of different things can happen. But yeah, ENFPs definitely can. Uh, uh, we have a reputation in certain quarters um, for being fickle. Um, and fickle, so fickle in the emotional sense, but then also fickle uh, in the intellectual sense. Um switching sides too easily for some people's liking um, for you know uh, seeming to talk out of two sides of our mouths by uh, having you know conceding points uh, to one person that we're in discussion about a particular topic with and then turning to another and they bring a bunch of other points and we're like mm hmm and you know we we might agree with those too even though those two parties think they have nothing in common uh, this kind of fickleness, I am going to get a bit feisty about. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, okay, wait, first I'll, I'll address the thing. I'll, I'll address the crazy thing briefly. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, and again, I, I don't see the point in fighting on this one too much. But you're with an ENFP, here's, I mean, essentially, here's what I think the problem is where the, the crazy reputation comes from. Um, we are very unconventional people. We have SI in the absolute last, well, not the absolute last place, but the, you know, and the bottom slot, the inferior position of our cognitive function stack. So this is a, a conflict that Eric Strauss talks about in that video that's in the link below that I've included in the description box. Um, about ENFP, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> um, the other conflict that Eric describes in that amazing little video, a little pep talk, but also, you know, also a conveyor of some terrific con new concepts that I had not heard of anyway that helped me to articulate some things about my experience and to understand what is up with other ENFPs too, is to say the other conflict that is chronic in the ENFP um, makeup that we have to somehow after a long, arduous, horrible process, <laughs> come to some grips with and try and manage in some way is what he calls the, the, the eternal conflict, the PERMA conflict that occurs between our tertiary function of TE and our inferior function of SI. TE, uh, extroverted thinking, is known for being a lot of things, but just I don't want to stick on this thing too long. So uh, it's known for being um, sort of using logic and objective kinds of measures and tools to uh, effect things um, in compared to TI, for example, to effect things in the outer world uh, in a rather expedient fashion um, in a way that gets quite a lot done. Um, that is instrumental. I think that would be the, the word, you know, if I had to choose one word to describe what TE is, in essence, it is instrumental. It is about, you know, it's about manipulating data, manipulating what's out there to make stuff happen. 
um, using rationality to put things in place to make things happen. Um, so we have that in the, that's the kind of thinking cognitive function we have. It's in the third spot, so it's pretty primitive. It's strong enough that we can lean on it sometimes for short periods of time. We can lean on it hard. Um, there's potential for some development there. Um, but as with everybody's third function, um, it's not that great. Its potential is not anywhere near as great as whatever our auxiliary function is, and it certainly can't touch whatever our dominant function has going on. Whatever we may tell ourselves to the contrary. Um, you know, it, see, it gets us through in, in pinches. It does. But anyhow, so that's, a, that's what we have is TE. Then in our last slot, we have what is at the other end of the, uh, the other end of the spectrum from our dominant function of extroverted intuition, which is introverted sensing. And introverted sensing, sensing is uh, one of those um, functions that Eric talks about as being a regulator. And I think that's, that's the perfect word for that. It, it really is um, a regulator. It's a systematic making sure everything's in order and is properly filed and functioning as a well-oiled machine. Um, I, uh, the uh, SI is all about that kind of thing. And in us, it is very, very weak. <laughs> it is very weak. It's the three-year-old in the car. And, um, and the other thing is that uh, the more, it also makes this good point, in, in our case with our dominant function of extroverted intuition, the more we're doing that, the more we're doing the extroverted intuition stuff, there is definitely a direct relation with whenever we are exercising our dominant function, we cannot be exercising the inferior. Um, it is effectively rendered completely and totally useless in, in that case because it has no place in the operations of extroverted intuition. It cannot be a helper in that. Not really. Um, so he says that's, you know, he points out that that's another conflict in ENFP that's dreadful to have to try and manage is you've got this function that he labels as, you know, TE, he labels as a push function. It's a, it's, it's to try and influence things in the environment and get stuff going the way, according to your plan, according to your thinking, your assassination and your sort of mobilizing of forces. But he said the problem is in mobilizing those forces, you can only go so far as an ENFP because your SI sucks. It sucks bad. And as long as you're doing all your extroverted intuition stuff, the stuff you that really is you, where you shine the most and, and where you live uh, fundamentally in your own mind, um, you can't be doing SI stuff. So he's like, well, that suck. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that doesn't work very easily right there either, that combo. So, oh boy. So yeah, so with an EFP, you've got quite a bundle of contradictions in a sense. I mean, I think it's a bit crude to say, but in effect, yeah, you kind of do. Um, you do have somebody whose character is rather... Uh, rather difficult to understand or where you you know you might see what you're supposed to see but you'll probably be like oh that it couldn't you know what I think I'm seeing there I couldn't be seeing because it's so incompatible with the all the rest of this person that I see it just doesn't seem very plausible so you don't even theorize correctly about <laughs> what, what you're actually seeing again you've got this person who is both a deeply, you know, again, I'm sorry, in other ENFPs and, you know, um, whatever, well, I'm sure I'll hear from you if you're, if you don't like this, but, uh, <laughs> but I think with, with a lot of, I think I'm not alone in this, you know, I think a lot of ENFPs could relate to this, is that we are both, I mean, yeah, it's not easy to get us, you know, I mean, in a way it is, there's, but that's, that's, that's it, that's it, that's the deceptive part, in, in a way, we're all too easy. We're all too obvious in so many respects. Um, we're just spilling over with the obviousness. Um, but that's the tricky thing about it is that there are these other parts of us that are actually quite subtle and complex and introverted and intense and very, very different from that. And they are going on and they are important and they are feeding into the whole system of the personality and having an influence on things. So it's there, there's sort of a lot of slights of, I wouldn't say slights of hand, but 
there are a lot of ways to not see the whole picture of an ENFP. And unfortunately, with such a complex, strange bunch of composite parts to the character, uh, if you don't see the whole picture, then the whole picture is going to look nuts. You know, it is going to look really nuts. So it's too bad for too bad for us, I would say. Um, anyway, but that's how it is. So um so yeah so we can we, we can be both uh we can really be confusing to people because on the one hand we are it's true that we are deeply many of us i'll speak for myself deeply silly people like very silly very silly people okay i know i get myself into ridiculous situations i get myself i've, I've said for a long time that very often my life strikes me as a bad sitcom a really bad a really bad sitcom like one that didn't even that n never made it anywhere near the pilot stage like it totally got killed after you know the third week of run throughs or whatever for just preliminaries it's just ridiculous you know this the, and I, I find that i get myself into these silly little situations where if i kind of get caught in the middle of one of them and then i have to explain how i got there <laughs> Like as it's coming out of my mouth and I'm trying to explain myself and explain how, how this could have happened to me, how I could find myself in this position, I find that as I'm trying to, to explain it, it just, I, it's just, it's just like, I'm just taking an ax to the trunk of the tree that I've climbed up in trying to even explain it because it's so nutty that, and it's so weird, the choices I made to get there, that it's, it's not helping my case at all. It would be better just to plead the fifth and shut up and let my lawyer do the, <laughs> do the talking about it, so to speak. So, yeah, so very silly. Getting myself into, and I, I find that, and again, maybe this is the ADHD too more, but, um, you know, I bet a lot of ENFPs can still relate, those that are functioning well and don't have a disorder. You know, they're just mildly disorganized, not like really, etc. And, uh, yeah, I find that it's just, just so much ridiculousness, <laughs> There's so much ridiculousness that happens. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, you've got, uh, I also would, sorry, uh, I would also say then uh, that I also have, I'm also very serious in some ways. So that can really, t I can, I understand why that really takes people by surprise. If they see me on one occasion and I'm, you know, I'm totally the one with the lampshade on their head at the party and doing whatever and saying whatever and being all wild and, and so on. But then you catch, but if you catch me at some other moment, perhaps even the next day, in a different context, I might be the most serious, you know, I might have the most serious look on my face and I will be very, very intense and I will be going down into the depths about something with someone um, and having a very serious conversation. And both those things are completely real and they both are part of me and they both are ready to come out um, all the time, you know, at any time, pretty much. Um, they are integral parts of my character and i know that a lot of other enfps share that in a general sense so again no wonder people are confused but i would say that um we're a lot less confused than you are i mean we have our moments for sure and we certainly have problems with with confidence and fitting in and all that but i think that a lot of um well i don't know their their enfps could have all kinds of problems but um, one of them for sure, though, is a confidence problem and is one of having to deal with the bad PR and the misunderstanding all the time. Um, I'd say that, I mean, I grew up in a family that was all other um, people with the intuitive uh, information gathering preference at the top two slots of their stack, so their cognitive function stacks. And those people, my parents were kind of isolated too. So it's like, I, oh, and I grew up in a really big city where it was, you know, I was going to school out of district. So it was very possible to um, be a bit atomized. So in that, in a way, um, I had the privilege and also the disaster of growing up on a w kind of weirdness farm where <laughs> really didn't have any idea until I was launched into the world as a young adult um, just how unusual all my little ways were to a lot not again not in artistic communities I'm nothing special at all knows you know there's nothing that weird about me at all but anywhere in the more sort of straight world anywhere where they're going to be a lot of SJs that's for damn sure like they do those people generally have no idea what to make of me and they don't want to know you know that's my experience um, 
they're not, you know, they, they find what I do at best. They find it occasionally hilarious and just, they just get a laugh out of how weird it is. But most of them are just like, you know, they, they don't want to know. Um, anyway, so I spent a lot of my twenties and into my early thirties kind of bouncing around in the world out there and bumping up against other people's more normative, socially normative expectations of me. And then me kind of going, wah, wah, you know, what's the, what's the problem? Cause I had nothing but acceptance in my family cause they were full of weird creative thinking weirdos too. So they didn't mind. Um, most of my stuff, but then I went out in larger wor world and I, I did bump up against it. And so there was a lot of that. That was a whole lot. And I, I'll bet you a lot of other ENFPs run into that too. And ENTPs where we go outside beyond our ken, And you know, if we didn't, if we didn't have the benefit of the training ground for the normal world of growing up with SJ parents say, or at least a sensor parent, like at least an SP in the mix somewhere to give us a perspective on what the mainstream expects. Um, or thinks about things. Um, yeah, we're just bumbling along, hoping for the best. <laughs> so anyway, so that's so that's tough. Um, so what can we do about all this? You know, what can we do about all this strangeness and, and heartache and misunderstanding and blah blah blah? Well, I don't know if there's that much, <laughs> but um, one thing for sure is. Um, learning a whole lot about the uh, MBTI and helping people that you would hope to be close to or have lasting bonds with, see if, you know, you can get them interested in it because it's sure, I mean, again, not to say it's the only way to understand things at all, but um, at all, but I, I certainly have found it to be really helpful for making, I mean, uh, this stuff already made sense to me, but what the Myers-Briggs has done um, has given me the kind of language to, um, and a conceptual framework with which to convey a lot more, much more quickly about to explain these strange features of an ENFP's uh, perspective and character. Oh, and I forgot about that. Didn't address the, the whole issue of like intellectual fickleness. All right. So here's what's going on there. I know a lot of ENFPs are criticized too um, for changing positions about things. Uh, changing their opinions about things over time and sometime over basically what the issue often is I've, I've heard again it hasn't been applied to me so much or not to my knowledge but I have heard this kind of going around out there um, that it, what is displeasing to people is not so much even necessarily the change in position but the rapidity with which the change of position can occur um, what I would say to those people too is, well, and, and again, like I don't, I don't know, I don't care enough about these people's, honestly, about these people's opinions to bother too much, but yeah, but, uh, I would say that again, if anyone else wants to fight that fight someplace, I would suggest that one, um, one thing to say about that is, uh, when you've got a mind that goes 900 miles an hour at all times, it only makes sense and also when you're leading with an information gathering function and when you have a perceiving preference uh, that wants you to keep things as open-ended as possible as long as possible and wants to have a great deal, a deal of variety in their experience and wants to hear actually enjoys hearing multiple sides of um, a given issue and enjoys entertaining the different possibilities and is not in any kind of a hurry to close it all down and move along the way J's are, um, which is quite, ar by the way, J's is, you know, you can say all you want, but that's quite arbitrary a lot of the time, you know, like some, uh, it does matter and it, it certainly does matter and it's certainly very useful, but let's face the fact that J people do the J thing a lot. A lot of the J things they do in their micro routines in the day are, they do them not because it has makes that much of a difference one way or the other. They just like to do it. That's cool. Um, and I would say that I just am arguing for the same kind of extension of acknowledgement of, of P habits. Um, again, it can be a totally, again, depends very much on the context and there certainly is too much of a perceiving attitude in many situations, blah, blah, blah. However, a lot of the time it's, you know, in this kind of cocktail party conversation kind of politics or, you know, whatever, um, the switching of sides or being open to hearing lots of different kinds of information about a topic, um, that would be the usual MO of a perceiver type person. I also, to be fair, also quite a few of the J's. So some of the J types are extremely open-minded. Um, 
But, you know, I don't think that's such a terrible fault, really. Again, people who are open to gathering new information about something constantly, event, I think it's only sensible that if new information comes to your attention about a particular issue that would affect what your opinion would be, all things considered, that you value, then the only sensible thing to do is change your opinion then. Um, I don't see what's so crazy about that. So the other thing, too, I would say about people who feel that um, are freaked out by uh, ENTPs or ENFPs and maybe others too, people's ability to have a very pluralistic way of thinking naturally and be very divergent thinkers. Um, what might seem like, I would suggest that what might seem like fickleness is not, um, or this talking out of both sides of your mouth is not what this sort of evil or malfeasant or whatever negative thing that you think it is. Um, I mean, mainly, mainly to, sorry, I'm kind of, I'm kind of feisty, but uh, for people who, I, I mean, I would just say this, um, here's what I'll say. When I hear that expression, well, there, there are always two sides to every story, you know, that homily, I, I always feel like laughing because I'm like, two sides to every story? Like, how about 70 sides to every story? Like, I can see 70 sides to every story. And... For those who would put me down and other um, people with the dominant intuitive intuition running their show, if, those who would put us down because we can hold many di very divergent ideas in mind at the same time and consider all of them um, and that we want to do that, uh, the fact that you can't do that or you don't want to do that, it's not my fault, bub. That's all I have to say about that. Um, so, okay. Now, how can things be better than for ENFPs or the people they love? I was, I was on that before. Again, the more you know about the MBTI and the more the people who love you know about it, I think that tends to be the better. It makes just makes so many communicational issues and all kinds of other things. It, fostering of understanding so much easier um, in many ways. It just adds to that. Uh, kind of campaign and um, the other thing I I mean I don't again I don't have unfortunately at this <laughs> late stage of my life I don't have that much wisdom to offer but um, you know thinking about Eric Strauss's inspirational message there about um, you know ENFP if you can finally come to find this you know if you can work it out you can work out how to figure out how to you know, tailor a plan and tailor strategies and, and means of reconciling these perma conflicts uh, in your character and your personality type. Um, you know, it's going to be amazing. Well, there's one thing in my life for sure I know that has worked. And um, I think that a principle behind it is something that could probably help a lot of the ENP people who want to find more balance. Basically, I think what we, what, um, you know, this way lies a better, ch you know, better chances at having more satisfaction in life and in the, the activities we take part in. Um, and for ENFPs, what that means in quality, you know, a big part of our quality of life will be in having good relation, you know, good intimate relationships with people and having, Again, I guess the, the, the struggle is always about having enough stability that your life doesn't suck, you know, your life is good even, um, but also having enough stimulation and variety and new things for your brain your, that's always running around, having new stuff for it to chaw on, uh, that's important to our survival, our very being also. So it's always like trying to balance that. You know, how do you do that? It's not obvious how to do that. Um, but one principle I've been able to think of there is that whenever it's, it's probably a good thing for a lot of us. I know it is for me anyway. It certainly has been. And it's also indicated by uh, the, the vocational list that suggested that uh, the ENFP types check out. Are <clears throat> setting up and building into our regular, our daily lives things that allow us, activities and occupations that allow us to both come and go. The very thing that <laughs> so many people, you know, find so distasteful or creepy or weird or whatever about us, difficult to get. This need to come and go at the same time, and definitely ENFP has that. Again, we, we, we do want some emotional, we want what we need emotional connection. We, we need engagement with other people. We need 
uh, some you need know, a good measure of stability and places to calm down and regulate right we need all the help we can get with the regulation aspect of things so um, especially as concerns you know external environment stuff so if we can get into situations that, that provide that for us kind of automatically, then that is really great. And one place where that is working for me, for example, is for several years I have uh, hosted travelers in my home. I've shared my home with travelers. And this has been a fantastic thing for me. And I'm really paying attention to it and sort of looking at where else I can effect such a good balance for myself and other things. Um, what that does for me is it allows me to have a stable home that I really like, be in one fixed place um, that has you know its routines and predictability and so on, and it's easy to maintain. Um, but where I am get so I'm staying and going at the same time. I'm staying right here, but I have the world coming to me in effect via these guests I have and I get to choose who they are and I have a lot of control over when people are here when they're not and which people and for how long and all of that I get to choose all that I get to regulate all of that um, but then I bring these people into this kind of social or they elect to come into the what ends up being um, among other things I mean prim obviously primarily for them it's a place to be while they're traveling it's a place to sleep but Quite often, I end up having these fantastic exchanges with these people that are really, really interesting. And of course, you know, when you're traveling, you're in a different kind of mindset. When you don't know if you're ever going to see the person again that you're meeting in your travels, you might share all kinds of interesting stories or things about yourself that you might not if you were at home. So, I mean, all of that feeds my NE's need for like novelty and engagement and the uh, NE and the FI, the need for engagement with people and like rich, interesting, abstract conversation and big meaning of life conversations. I mean, these people are literally traveling, traveling around the planet to come to my house, right? I mean, that's not to come to my house. You know what I mean? Like, but practical in practical terms, that's what they're doing. So they have things to tell me, and I keep notes, and it's like it's, it just feeds all that. But it feeds it in a way that doesn't have me like running off in all directions and making a big, bigger mess than I need to <laughs> to do what I do. You know, as a dominant intuitive, ex, ex, extroverted intuitive. So that's a way it can work. So I, I think that maybe that way lies a good amount of satisfaction for a lot of ENP people. Um, or, you know, if you can do some sort of um, the way you make your money is as some sort of a consultant where you get to have a lot of uh, autonomy and you have to uh, you get you get to work on things that you're really particularly interested in and you get to direct when and how they happen and for what price to a certain extent and where you can really kind of orchestrate, you know, maximum freedom for your any to do what it likes to do and what it should do. Like what it's built to do, but not mess everything else up that's important for you in life. <laughs> you know, like that's your health and your, you know, your sleep hygiene and you're just getting too, too, having too much going on sometimes and whatever. So anyway, those kinds of situations I think can really help. And um, so that's it. I think I'm almost done. And then the last thing too, I would say to those who, you know, find us, um, don't, again, maybe they've listened to, I can't imagine that anyone listened to all of this, but you know, if somebody did, <laughs> let's say, let's say again, I like to, I met Dom and E. I liked anything could happen. I like to think that, um, let's say somebody, you know, did watch all of this and they took it all in and they understood what I was saying and they considered it and they're still like, you know, you should just be like this, you know, to those people. And I would say, well, you know, here's the thing. Do you give, you know, I would just say to people, for us to run around and to need that kind of stimulation in our lives, um, again, to tell us that we're wrong in that and that we should feel bad about it and that we should just settle down and stop all that nonsense. And, and that would be like, that's as nutty and in, and completely uh, impossible as to tell someone um, who has say extroverted sensing as their dominant function to like 
just, you know, you don't need these, these interesting experiences. You don't need to wear nice clothes that feel nice against your skin. You don't need to, you know, like basically tell them that everything they're about and that they enjoy and that drives them in life and that they're really good at, you know, um, decorating a beautiful room for a party or whatever it is. Um, you know, if you were an ESFP, for example, um, to just tell them that that's silly and stupid and they should just stop it. I mean, or to tell an introvert, you know, um, that if, you know, if you really love me, then you would just be able to spend all day with me every day and just interact with me whenever I want and with everybody else and just be, you know, uh, ready to do that and have, and also to be perfectly fine the entire time you're doing it. Well, that is a really unreasonable request and it's not going to, it can't, you can't have what you want. You just can't have that. Same thing with someone with dominant extroverted intuition. If you love somebody like that, then you have to, you have to make an adjust. Like if you have a judgy, pissy attitude about our need to explore, which is what our, our operating system is all about, then you need to stay away from us, I guess, or you need to change your attitude and realize that all of this like frolicking, what looks to you like a bunch of useless, silly frolicking that means nothing. Um, it's, it's what we do. And, and again, it's, it's where we get all of the raw. That's where we gather all of the raw material to do the things that are best about us. And that would have ever made anybody like us in the first place. Um, and why have made, if you ever liked us, made you like us in the first place. Um, and that's the thing is like, I, 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 again, I'm, I would like, um, people, people who would, who would like, who like ENFPs at all. You know, and again, plenty of people don't, and that's fine. This stuff isn't for them that I'm talking about. Um, but for those who do, um, that's the thing. It's like, I, I, you know, if you love us, I would say encourage us to, to regulate more and to develop our skill in that area by all means. You know, give us a look now and then. Raise an eyebrow. Um, or whatever. Whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do as concerns us. But, but... Um, but also try and, res you know, try and have some basic respect for our doing what our dominant function impels us to do. Um, you don't have to join in it all the time or whatever. That's still too much to ask. But to not piss on it is what I do ask. Because here's the thing. That is the source of all of the stuff that, you know, that is likable and, and great about us when we are likable and great. And the thing is, when we are, <laughs> ah, I think of, you know, my dear uh, ENFP friend, Tamara, who, when we were talking about such issues of misunderstanding and, and being disparaged for doing things of how we do them and why we do them, um, she said, it's like, you know, she, she gave me the thing that was the inspiration for the name of the videos. And she said, it's like that Nicki Minaj, that song, Marilyn Monroe song, where she has that passage. Um, maybe call, you know, maybe it's, maybe I'm cursed. Maybe I can't remember what it is. Maybe I'm cursed. Maybe I'm blessed. If you can't handle my worst, you ain't getting my best. <laughs> I was like, we need to need to point this on a little cushion to marrow each of us. I'll make one for you. You make one for me so that when you know, everyone's all pissed off and pissy about us and our gallivant, our gallivanting around and our, uh, you know, having fun and doing weird things. Um, you know, when everyone's all mad, we can have our little pillows and just like <laughs> have our little pillows. <laughs> anyway, oh, I thought that was good. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing is like, if you let us do our thing and, um, you know, you, you, you're not being a, a, a dick about it, <laughs> basically, um, it might be worth your while someday. If you like us at all, you like what we do. We like what we have to give at all. Because the thing is when we're good, we're really good. You know, even if we are like, if you want to have a really an interesting philosophical discussion right in the middle of a gigantic, uh, warehouse dance party at five in the morning we'll do that like to us that's not even weird that's totally doable that's totally fine if you want someone who can you know follow you and might be interested in and almost everything that you're really interested in we can find the interest in ourselves to like ask you some questions about it and actually be into what you have to say if you like you know the fact that with our 
silly slash serious slash silliness and our creative thinking that we can come up with a kind of fun that's better than any drugs you've ever had at the drop of a hat sometimes and it's nothing for us to conjure it um if you like that then again it's a lot of that's coming from the dominant extroverted intuition so um anyway i hope that <laughs> To this long videos i hope that um, those of you who watched them that you got something out of it and that i didn't wear you out too much and um that if you have anything to say anything to ask or comment upon or add to what i started um please please do comment i would love to read what you have to say thank you for watching